the first in class BTK inhibitor, as we're all aware, is a brutinib, which inhibits BTK covalently and quite potently, but not that specifically. It does have a number of other targets that it hits. EGFR, for example, can contribute to rash and diarrhea that we see with a brutinib. And then a couple of the targets we most worry about include TEC, which can affect platelet function. And so inhibiting BTK and TEC together can often result in increased bleeding and decreased platelet function. And then ITK was of interest, particularly because it inhibits antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity when ITK is inhibited by brutinib, for example. And that could affect the ability to combine with antibodies, such as rituximab. But despite this, brutinib was obviously a very effective drug and is the first-in-class inhibitor, particularly for high-risk patients, really astonishingly effective in terms of actually saving the lives of the patients who got it initially on the trials who had heavily pretreated relapsed refractory disease. At this point, of course, abrutinib is approved for any line of therapy for any CLL patient as a single agent, as well as combined with abinutuzumab frontline. It is generally given at 420 milligrams daily. The only reason to use a dose reduction is if you're combining with a drug that affects abrutinib metabolism. So those are mostly moderate to strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. And in that case, you have to be very careful. In you. So you always want to review medication lists before you do start abrutinib. Abrutinib is better tolerated in younger patients. We'll talk about this more later. But I do find the toxicity goes up significantly as patients get older, and it can be harder to remain on the drug. Now, with second-generation inhibitors, such as acalabrutinib, Alan, do you want to tell us about acalabrutinib? Yeah, of course. Uh, certainly, as, as Jennifer pointed out, it would have changed the paradigm of treatment in CLL and in other B-cell malignancies. But uh, the issues of off-target enzymatic inhibition uh, may become problematic. So uh, newer second-generation uh, BTK inhibitors have been uh, developed. Uh, there are third-generation ones being in development right now. So acalabrutinib is an approved um, medication for CLL and SLL for all indications frontline or relapsed, uh, independent of uh, um, risk factors and, and, and cytogenetics. Uh, and the goal of the development of a calibrinib is to try to do a quote unquote a cleaner drug. It's specific for, for BTK. Uh, it does have some off target uh, enzymatic inhibition, but not as strongly as a brutinib. So the goal is trying to uh, make a drug that perhaps will have less side effects than a brutinib. We don't know yet if that's true because the ongoing head to head comparison trials are, are not finalized yet. Uh, mainly there's the Resonate uh, RR trial, uh, which is comparing Britney versus Calabritinib in high-risk uh, disease with deletion 11Q and 17P in relapsed disease. But uh, Calabritinib has been evaluated in the frontline setting uh, with or without obinutuzumab in combination uh, and in relapsed setting as monotherapy compared to idolalcib or benamosine rituximab and it was proven to be an efficacious therapy for CLL. Uh, the clinical experience with the Calabritinib uh, in terms of side effects and tolerability is a little bit different than in Brutinib. Uh, it seems that uh, there's, there's still bruising and bleeding with the Calabritinib, but it seems to be of a different aspect than in Brutinib in terms it's not as overt and uh, the particular rash seems to be a little bit better controlled. Uh, we're seeing less epistaxis. On the clinical experience, again, there's no head-to-head -head comparison there. Uh, it is an efficacious drug, as I said. Interestingly, uh, the frontline trial combined acalabrutinib with, with obinutuzumab and has an arm that had acalabrutinib as monotherapy. Unfortunately, this was not powered to do a comparison between both arms, but uh, the arm that included obinutuzumab did provide an improvement on the, on the subgroup analysis of patients who had IgG mutated disease when compared to chlorambucil obinutuzumab in the clinical trial. Uh, it's food for thought, it's hypothesis driving, and to some extent maybe because there is less ITK inhibition with the calibrutinib, as Jennifer pointed out, uh, it is an issue with, with ibrutinib, and maybe that it allowed the antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity uh, driven by obinutuzumab to still be affected, whereas ibrutinib may inhibit uh, ITK and decrease the effect of ADCC uh, when combining it with, with a different agent. 
So uh, it's a newer drug. We don't have as long as an experience with the calabrutinib when compared to brutinib. Brutinib has over five year follow up in the resonate trial, for instance. So it may be that we see more side effects down the road, side effects that may be uh, coming later on. We know that hypertension is an effect of brutinib that increases over time, uh, may be the case with the calabrutinib as well. Uh, but it was, uh, it's, a, it's an efficacious and safe drug overall, and it's out there. Uh, we have to evaluate this more in the real world setting. There's a number of, of studies done with the Britinib in that setting uh, to see what is the uh, side effect profile and the toxicity profile in the older population. So there's still data coming out with that uh, in terms of tolerability, but it's a valid option for patients.